Welcome. Merry Christmas. Wow, that was a powerful response. Blew me away. Merry Christmas. There we go. Thank you for those who have given poinsettias. They're beautiful this morning. You'll see other announcements in your bulletin, including the Christmas Eve service. So Friday from 6 to 6.30 in the evening, you're welcome to come here for a candlelight service and just to start Christmas off right. Now, have something that might be a little confusing happening today. We'll have the offering where the plates go around. Then in reverse, and those doing the offering, remember the choir law, okay? A basket will go around and it's filled with nickels. Take one nickel, okay? So usually you give to the offering. But the second time a basket comes around, take a nickel and save it for the sermon, okay? You'll need it during the <coughs> sermon, a nickel, all right? So be aware of that. As far as prayer updates on your prayer request list on the back of your bulletin, praise God that Barbara Hall, Ronnie's mother, is back at home and doing a little better. John Rose uh, had a triple bypass, and then he had a stent put in, a fourth area of blockage, and the carotid artery surgery is on hold for right now. So he's in ICU at Memorial Regional. Continue to remember he and Sandy in your prayers. <laughs> Let's go to God in prayer now. Father God, we praise you and we thank you for Jesus. And today as we just praise you in song and in word, I pray that it would not be a show but that it would be worship. Lord, for all those at home, in the fellowship hall, maybe folks that could not be here today because they're in the hospital, Lord. They can't get out on their own. I pray your grace and your presence of power, healing power, and help. Lord, help us as we worship together to leave here challenged, changed, and encouraged by the presence of Christ. All God's people said... Amen.
Okay, kids, come on up. Now, we're going to do something a little different today, so come on up to where I am, up to this platform. We're going to give the grown-ups a message today, so come on up here. Y'all come on up here, and let's line up in a line. So come on up. There you go. And you stand right here. And then you stand right here. All in a line. We may have to squeeze in kind of tight. There you go. There we go, right here. You come on over and stand there. Hey. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. <laughs> Don't let anybody see the letter yet. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to show them this special word. You can hold it. There you go. All right, on my cue, hold this up and show everybody the letter. Go, hold up the letter. Christmas. All right. Now, I want these three to put your letter down. And everyone else hold up their letter. Go, hold it up. Right. <laughs> Good job, guys. The reason why I just had you do that is because in the word Christmas, it starts off with the word Christ. Because Jesus is the reason why we celebrate Christmas. Jesus Christ. So more than Santa Claus or reindeer or elves, Jesus came to show us God's love and Christ is the reason for Christmas. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for Christmas. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. sing. Let's stand as we sing. Father, even in this.
this chaotic world, we can experience your love and grace in sending your son Jesus to die on the cross. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for these opportunities that you've given us to give back what you've blessed us with. Father, we pray that you'll take a portion, bless it, multiply it, and be used for the servant of thy kingdom. We ask in your son's name. As the baskets go around after the offering for nickels, I'm told that we may not have enough nickels. So if you're a married couple and you can share a nickel, go for it. from now, a piano tuner is going to find 
couple nickels in that piano somewhere and wonder how that happened. <laughs> Hi, Sharon. Before I preach, Sharon, man, come and lead us in song. your baby boy would someday walk on water. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you deliver will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked You may not uh, realize it, but probably the best sermon that any of you have heard has already come to you from someone who doesn't go to church, may not even believe in Jesus. And I'd imagine that probably most of you have heard this sermon. The sermon goes something like this. I don't need to go to church. After all, what a bunch of hypocrites they are over there. Has anyone heard that sermon? I know I have. Some of it is unfair. Some of it is a cop-out from someone who may not be ready for their own reasons to go to church. But some of it, if the shoe fits, wear it. The main message that any 
Christian, someone who has given their lives to follow Jesus needs to hear is, don't, whatever you do, be a hypocrite. Don't say one thing and then go do something else. Don't judge someone according to this standard and then not live it yourselves. What we Christians, what we preachers need more than anything else is a faith that works. A faith that works. This is the message that James has for us this morning. Toward the end of your New Testament, in James chapter 2, I invite you to take your Bibles and open it up to James chapter 2, starting in verse 14. Now I'd like to start off by reading verses 14 through 17 of chapter 2 of James. James 2, 14 says, What good is it, my brothers or sisters, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Mm. First truth for the morning is this. Know that do-nothing faith doesn't do anything. Know that do-nothing faith doesn't do anything. Now by faith, what is faith? Faith, first of all, is looking at the invisible God and believing that he's there. That he exists, you see all that he has made. And believing that he has sent Jesus Christ, his only son, to us. And that this man who was son of the living God lived for you, lived for me here on earth. He was born in a manger. He grew up, he taught us who God was in action He lived out who God was, how God feels, what God does, what his truth is. Jesus showed it to us. It was the best object lesson ever given. Then Jesus died on the cross. It was a cross of his own choosing. Yes, the sin of this evil world system did it to him, but he went willingly to the cross to be put to death, not because he was guilty, not because he was a troublemaker, but because I am guilty. And I have turned and gone my own way, and you have gone your own way from God. And when we have faith, we believe that the cross happened and that it was for you, that it was for me. And we believe, we have faith that Death itself could not keep a hold on Jesus. And on Easter morning, his tomb was empty because he was alive. He was raised. Showing that in him, we not only have our sins paid for by the mercies of God, but we have new life in this world and in the world to come, in the new heavens and the new earth. That's what faith is. Now back to James chapter 2, starting at verse 14. His point is simply this. If you've got do-nothing faith, it doesn't do anything. In other words, if we've got something we believe in our heads and we feel nice, warm, and fuzzy feelings in our heart and then it doesn't translate into action, it's really not faith at all. All true faith does something. Now, 
disclaimer here. But we need to have a disclaimer. I, in my own life, am a strong believer in this truth. I am not saved, nor am I forgiven, nor do I have any hope of heaven or of new life because I deserve it, or because I have worked some ritual, or because I have done this, or I've been a good person. It is all by grace from beginning to end. Uh, the only way I have any hope is not by my works, but by faith in what God has done. And His faithfulness holds me steady. And yet, there is this thing that I'll call today do-nothing faith. That many of us cling to thinking that it's the real thing. Do-nothing faith is... Wanting the crown without the cross. Saying we have faith with no action. Saying that we want God's way and then we want to go our way. To be forgiven without changing. This is do nothing faith. Dietrich Bonhoeffer called it cheap grace where we take God's grace, we take the power of Jesus Christ into our lives, we say we believe it, and then we just keep on going like nothing ever happened, saying to ourselves, well, we're okay now, it's, our sins have been passed over, we don't have to worry about it, and we certainly don't have to worry about following Jesus because we're just saved by Jesus. John, the half-brother of Jesus, says... In verse 17, faith by itself, do nothing faith, if it does not have works, is dead. Do nothing faith is useless or even dangerous. If you try to believe in Jesus and then ignore his call on your life, you allow the devil to steal God's blessings of joy, God's blessings of peace, God's blessings physically and tangibly in your life and in your relationships. Worse than that, it's dangerous because other people, let's say if I just say I believe in Jesus and I check it off on a box of a questionnaire, yes, I'm a Christian, and yet my life shows nothing of that reality, if I have do-nothing faith, it's dangerous because other people who do not know Jesus will look at me and my do-nothing faith and be turned away from Jesus Christ. And what is worse than that? To be accountable. At the end of time, when I see Jesus face to face and Jesus looks at me eye to eye and says, Keith, Yes, this person is separated from my presence forever because they did not believe in me. They would not hear the message, but you know what made it much easier for them? Because you showed them that the gospel was worthless with your life. You showed them that Christianity is irrelevant. You showed them that faith is fake by your life. I, for one, don't want to hear that and see that. And that's the reason why do-nothing faith is useless or even dangerous. And more than that, verse 14 ends with this question. Can that faith, that do-nothing faith, save him? Do-nothing faith can't save you. Oh, well, wait a minute, Keith. The Bible says that if you have faith in the Son of God... If you have faith in what Jesus does, that's it. It's all, all that's said and done, you're forgiven. You're, yes. But if your faith is real, if you actually have turned your life over to Jesus, you're still living by grace. We still need forgiveness. But if there is no attempt to follow Jesus in action, you don't have the faith 
that can save you from eternal damnation in hell. That's what James is saying right here. Can that faith save you? It's That kind of do-nothing faith is like having an infected wound. And my saying, here you go, here's a Band-Aid, and putting that Band-Aid on your infected wound. Can that Band-Aid heal you? Or having terminal cancer, the only hope of any type of uh, salvation or help or healing in your life is to go to the doctor's office and have a painful chemotherapy, which could very well save you and give you decades of new life afterwards. And you saying, yes, I know I have cancer, and I believe it, and I believe that the doctor can save me. I believe in the effectiveness of chemotherapy and then never showing up for your doctor's appointment. Can that faith save you from cancer? It's the same way with Jesus. Yes, Jesus, I believe in you. Yes, I believe you came to the cross for me. Yes, I believe you rose from the dead. Thank you very much. I'll let you know when I need your help from here on out. Can that faith save you? The Bible clearly says in verse 17, no. So faith by itself, that kind of do-nothing faith, if it does not have works, is dead. Just like a, a Christmas tree. A Christmas tree that you buy alive. Okay, let's say you were able to actually find one. Uh, that uh, had been cut, and it's still green, and you set it up in your house, and it smells wonderful, and you celebrate it, and it looks good, except for this fact. It's been separated from the sap of life. It has been cut off at the roots. It is already dying and will be dead, and in time, sometime in January, it'll begin, or sooner, It'll drop its needles, it'll look brown and ugly, and you'll be looking for a to get rid of it. Amen? It's the same way with do-nothing faith. Do-nothing faith may look good at church. It may look good in front of your friends. You may be able, I may be able to put on a good act, and preachers can be very good at being hypocrites. But if it is not a if I am not grounded into the life of the vine, the life of Jesus Christ, and abiding in Him in that life, it's only a question of when that type of do-nothing faith will be shown to be dead as a Christmas tree on January 14th. So we reach the second point which is simply show a faith that works. I want you to know, if you didn't already figure it out, I am preaching to myself this morning. Don't think that I'm over here just stomping on your shoes and picking on you as if I'm standing aloof on some type of other level. I am standing as a Christian who needs to be challenged by this word on Christmas Show a faith that works. Let's look at James chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. James 2, 18. But if someone will say, you have faith and I have works, show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You can put on a good show of works without faith. That won't save you. But neither will saying you have faith and no life change comes with it. Verse 19, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. I often will ask someone, are you a Christian? Or do you have faith? And they'll say something like, I believe in God. James is saying, that's great. Yes, Satan believes in God, too, and he's creeped out by it. I mean, he shudders. He runs for safety. 
when he even thinks about the thought of the living God. Is he saved? Verse 20, Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. Paul argues very strongly in other places in the New Testament seems to be contradictory when he says that Abraham was saved by faith, not in anything he did. James was like, yes, that is true, but his faith was shown by what he did. He followed God in his life. He trusted the Lord and did what was right. He Even to the point of trusting that God could save his son Isaac, and he did. And because that faith was not a do-nothing faith, but true blue faith, Abraham was saved. Verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was it not also Rahab, the prostitute, justified by works? When she received the messengers and sent them out by another way, any of you don't remember that story? The children of Israel were getting ready to come in the promised land, enemy-occupied territory. They sent out spies, and the spies were about to be captured. And a prostitute there in the city of Jericho hid those spies in faith that God was going to take that promised land and give them to the children of Israel. But how did she show her faith? By actually putting herself at risk and protecting his people. You see, she was saved by faith, but it wasn't do-nothing faith. It was faith in action. Verse 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Now, true faith is more than what you believe in your head. It must change your life. Let's take this Nickel out. Old Crazy Keith passed out nickels and they ended up in the piano and maybe some of you don't even have any. <laughs> Choir, it sounded like each of them were getting a dozen apiece, I think, back there. All the... Well, you take this coin. Is this coin, it's got Thomas Jefferson on one side, right? Is this coin heads? And that's all there is to this coin? No, there are two sides to this coin, right? You cannot have the front of the coin without also having the tail side of the coin. That's the way coins are, right? There's a heads and a tails. This is faith right here, your faith in Jesus. And right here on the heads is Jesus Christ. You believe who he is. It's all about what you have resolved in your mind and given in your heart. But there's another side of your faith. It is faith in action. It is faith that responds in real specifics in your life. It begins with baptism. You trust that Jesus has forgiven you, and it starts with that first step of obedience by being baptized. Why does, why does Jesus command us to be baptized? Because from the very beginning, he wants us to understand faith without works is dead. Step out and be baptized in front of everyone. Show outwardly what is happening inwardly. And that's the first step of the same pattern which will continue to unfold for the rest of your life until the Lord comes for you. Faith saves you as it is worked out in you. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, make this very clear. When it tells Christians who've been saved, 
I've been saved. If you've been saved, I've been saved by what Jesus has done, not what, what I have done. But listen to what Philippians 2, 12 through 13 says. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We're saved by Jesus and what he has done, and then we begin a new life now of following him in the specifics of daily life by working out our salvation with deep reverence. So there are some faults and sins that I have that I just keep encountering along the way, the way over and over again. I keep falling for the same stuff over and over. You have that. Maybe it's patience that's a problem for you. Maybe it's resentment. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's uh, spending money or wanting to hoard money. Maybe it's uh, the way you treat other people in this way or that way. Whatever it is, it's a weakness that you have. But now, following Jesus, we are commanded to work out our salvation. For me, I need to recognize where I'm weak and where I fail and actually make, take the initiative to make some plans of how I can be more faithful to Jesus in those areas. And along the way, I'm going to fail. I know that. But I live in grace as I walk by faith. And I can immediately get back up after I've fallen, go back to Jesus and ask for forgiveness, and begin to walk in the right direction again. Not on probation, not, to, not unsaved for a while and then saved again, but I can walk by grace with a living faith that works. And I may need to have others hold me accountable. Confess your sins one to another I, this week. I have an old sin that bothers me periodically, and I actually, I was embarrassed to call one of you because, you know, I've, I've got everything under control as a preacher, right? Yeah, ha, ha. All right, just ask Tammy. She could give you a long list of ways that I fall short. But I had another brother in Christ that I respect, and I called him on the phone, and I said, Brother, I have fallen for the same old trap again. And this is what I've done, and it's wrong, and I know it. The Lord has talked to me about it before. I have no excuses. I need forgiveness. He prayed with me over the phone, and I said, I want you to do this. I want you to call me up periodically and ask me about how I'm doing in this area. Hold my feet to the fire. You see, it, it takes more than wishful thinking. It takes more than just, oh, God, I promise I will not mess up like that again. It takes living in grace but working it out, working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Because that's the faith that will change things and give you hope and give you blessing and make you a Christian in your heart and in your life. And someone else who doesn't believe in Jesus will look at your life and think, well, there's someone with some faults. I mean, look at that. But they're honest about it. And there's something else working here that I can't quite explain. There's a humility. There's a joy. There's, they're living and have hope. And why do they have hope? What's going on? I want to know more about that. And you yourself will be the best sermon that they hear. Why? Because you have faith that works. Not faith that is perfect and complete. That won't happen until you're with the Lord in heaven. But faith that is not do-nothing faith, but substantial, true, life-changing, blessing and hope-giving faith here on earth. Now all of you have seen or heard that old saying, put the Christ back in Christmas. Have anybody heard that? People have it on bumper stickers of your cars and you know they talk about it it's a nice little punchy saying that has a lot of good truth to it the same truth that I just showed that the kids helped me show you it is Jesus Christ who is the reason for Christmas it's not about a man with a long white beard it's not about presents it's not about a shopping cycle 
It's not about uh, this or that trapping our culture. It's about Christ. Let's make it about Christ again. Well, I've got something even more true and more essential for Christians today. Put the Christ back in Christian. Put the Christ back in Christian and the gates of hell cannot prevail against that type of faith. A faith that actually works in real life. A faith that can actually be seen. A faith that can actually open the doors wide open uh, to your life for Jesus to come in and help you and forgive you and work with you. Take this nickel if you were lucky enough to get one as the basket came around. Put it in your pocket and every now and then when you reach in your pocket, remember that issue that the Lord has brought to your attention. You know what it is. It could be, I need to be baptized. It could be, I need to be an active part of a church family. It could be, it is time for me to get serious and kick this habit that is an offense before God. It could be, I need to be kind to my wife. It could be, I need to not watch this TV show. It could be, I need to give of myself rather than just being a taker. It will always be specific when the Lord works. Take the faith that you say you believe and that I say I believe and put it into action there. It's overwhelming when you think about all the areas that need to be changed in your life. Well, just start in one place. Just start and let the Lord work there. Welcome to faith that does something. Faith that will save you. The power of Jesus Christ working in you. Father God, free us. Free uh, us from the illusions of hypocrisy. The pipe dream of a fake plastic Christianity that's full of punchlines and judgmentalism and short on substance. Father God, I pray, opening my life to you, and I confess to you that I, at times, have been a fraud. I need the grace of Jesus Christ worked out in real time in my life. And Lord, there are specific areas this morning that I need to open up to you. I am yours, and I am tired of a do-nothing faith. I am yours. Come in and do as you will. All God's people said, Amen. Let's stand as we sing. Oh, come all ye faithful.
best the choir to lead us in our benediction.